Hi, this is Jim Rivas, CEO of Cloud Security Alliance, and I hope you have been enjoying the CSA AI Summit and all of the great presentations we've had, and we're here in day two, and I have my own presentation, which I'm excited to give you, to give you my perspective on this topic. And generative AI and, and how we think that's going to impact cybersecurity, how we think it's going to impact cloud, and where we go from here. So certainly, as you've heard and you heard me before in the opening, this is just a fundamental technology trend, maybe the biggest trend of our lifetimes. It's a huge pivot that many organizations around the world are making right now, governments are looking at. And there's so much hype around this topic, certainly, that my hope is that I can provide some information that maybe will take some of that hype out and get us grounded a little bit on what we practically need to be doing and thinking about. And then we'll just take it from there and see what sorts of outcomes we get for, for the industry. So. Just a, a little bit of a disclaimer, the topic itself is just moving so quickly and we are seeing new innovations just on a daily basis where you're finding new sorts of mashups, new ways of coaxing some of these generative AI systems and mashing them up with maybe other things that we originally didn't understand it could write code as good as it, as it could. And so the, that fact just makes it a very much a likelihood, particularly if you look back at what I'm saying a couple of years from now, that, that it's very fair if I actually say a couple of things that turn out to be BS. And so feel free to call me out on that as well. I, I don't mind that at all, because it's really important that we sort of figure out what those fundamental issues are. And it's gonna take that community analyzing this it's the cybersecurity experts the cloud experts the ai experts policy makers risk managers it's going to take that whole community for us to get to a place that where we need to be so i wanted to share a little bit just sort of on my my thesis and positioning uh, around this and when we think about generative ai and i'm there's been other presentations and ones that are coming up that provide more of the definitional work. And so I'm gonna just provide a little bit for my con the context for my talk. But uh, you know, generative AI, that's obviously it's a it's a portion, a subset of the overall field of artificial intelligence. Uh, machine learning is is a pretty fair way to characterize it, I think. And but the the thing is about how this is something that, became uh, what it is and was adopted so virally. I like to just create my own sorts of fun ways of characterizing it and how I would how I would say this is the cloud and AI had a baby and they named it chat GPT. That's kind of what happened. So it's AI has been around for a long time. We've been using it for a long time, but for it to be something that was actually front and center where virtually anyone that is connected to the internet, which is a majority of the world's populace, they can actually interact and be co-creators of generating content with ChatGPT, and that's viral. And so this is something that, you know, you can think about a little bit, that's the, the way it sort of dawned on me what's happening is, is this is sort of a fun way to kind of characterize what has, uh, occurred over the, the course of the last few months and couple of years. So when I think a little bit and try to communicate what is that sort of zeitgeist today around generative AI, and I, I talk to different types of organizations, different people, different attitudes, and you can kind of put them in, in different buckets. Uh, I think broadly speaking, just about everyone is excited about the possibilities of what you might be able to do with this technology. So I'd say that there's also a pretty broad lack of understanding about how generative AI and the, the large language models work under, under the hood. 
And that's completely understandable. I think most of that escapes me as well. Uh, I'm making a concerted effort to understand it better. But I think that that's certainly very common. And so hopefully events like this can help provide a lot more information around that. So, um, you know, in, in addition to not really understanding some of those core pieces, how that works, I think there's a lot that has to do with just that perspective and and let's put this in context and how are the different ways in which large language models are could be bundled how are they going to be delivered to users how is that sort of work what's that whole sort of life cycle supply chain that delivers a large language model to you at a at a at a chat prompt and you know what does that mean to businesses and users so so what I find is like really uh, common is large enterprises, uh, ex especially if it's a regulated enterprise, they are, are almost uh, completely blocking this, except for like innovation centers. That's very common. They have an innovation center that goes back to that first point. What are the possibilities? How can we reinvent our business? Uh, smaller businesses, businesses less regulated, uh, businesses that are in certain part of the world where they feel like there's not today a huge amount of oversight, they are more aggressive in their adoption and usage of this. And that's tech companies to a big degree, I think, fit that. And so uh, that, that, as I mentioned before, we're just seeing so many new uh, innovations and things that we said a week ago, you can't do that. And now you can do that. And so um, all of this together, sort of the lack of understanding, feeling like something's moving more quickly than you can keep up with is leading to a lot of fear. So fear about is, is the matrix right around the corner? Is usage of a generative AI system, a large language model, immediately going to be like emptying all of the proprietary information out of my company? Is it going to be emptying all of the money out of my vaults. What all is, is going to happen here? Is, is this going to create some things for which there's going to be no way back from? And so it's it's definitely fair for us to have concerns, but really uh, knowledge takes away that fear and I think makes it more balanced. And that's again where we need to go to. But just to understand this is this is where I think most of the world is, I, I would characterize it from who I've talked to. So again, there's going to be, uh, and th there has been, and there's going to be more presentations here about things like LLMs. Caleb Saima in the very last presentation here on day two is going to be presenting demystifying the LLMs and risk and that's going to be, I think, pretty authoritative and definitely check out that that final session. So, but how how would I describe it? And definitely whenever asked me, how, how do I describe something that's generative AI? Of course, I asked chat GPT and, and, and similar tools. And and this is sort of a, a pretty representative way of explaining it, large language models and artificial intelligence model that's trained to understand and generate human-like text. And it, this is very much like what we've traditionally termed as machine learning, taking a lot of information to train systems. So you, you might you hear a lot about tokens and what that is. And this is sort of that, that initial stage of the large language model ingesting the, the the text that is fed to it in some way, whether it's from users all around the world putting in their their text through chat GPT uh, prompts or it's some corpus of data that's been fed into it through some other method, some other API. But the the text is broken into smaller units based on that particular model, the particular, methodology. And there's a lot of them out there. I think people are sort of kind of understanding that there may have only been to your mind, if you're fairly new to this, one LLM in January of 2023, and you're probably now aware of, of quite a few of them. And so they'll do some of these things uh, a little bit differently. They all do things a little bit differently, but you you basically have this 
step of turning the the text into tokens so it can be nip- manipulated better by the code and the machines. And so transformation is where you're really taking this and you're trying to relate the tokens to other tokens and and where do they show up next to each other more often. And there's a lot of other sorts of contexts and ways that you actually create those relationships. But that's what the transformation is. And that's something that's like, it's it's critical, takes a lot of compute. All of this takes takes a lot of compute. And then once you have that transformation, the, the generation uh, according to whatever the specific uh, query is, the model predicts the following tokens in succession. And so it seems like magical responses. It seems like there's this human that's all knowing that's talking back to you, but it's actually sort of the statistical model. It's not consciousness that's actually doing this. And there's there's variability. There's randomness that's in this. And you'll hear about this thing called temperature, which is a parameter that says, you know, how how random do you want this to be versus deterministic, meaning the most likely token to follow next is almost always the token that follows next. And so to to do this, it's it's really the 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 secret not secret is that there's just so much compute that's going into this so much you've probably heard about nvidia the the company that kind of became known as creating video processors and and so much of that video compute power video cpus has been uh, repurposed into doing things like machine learning and, and Mellanox, like high-speed network connections, which Mellanox, I believe, was a separate company that's now actually part of NVIDIA. And there are others that are out there, but that's just one that's uh, um, very well known and makes the heart of a lot of LLM systems you are seeing. But without huge amounts of compute power, we would not be seeing this delivered uh, where the way it is. And it's delivered predominantly as a service, which if you're wondering why you know, Cloud Security Alliance, and I'll talk more about that, why we are being so involved in this topic, this is a, a big reason why, and, and I'll explain more about that. So this is what it does, and it, it takes all this data, and people definitely have concerns or want to understand that it takes all this information out there and it creates these these models that do some pretty amazing things. Now, when I go read what I I see in sort of the media about this or listen to a few other people talk about this and and talk about their the concerns and what do we do to mitigate some of the different risks, I think it's a fair question to say are we are we really looking in the right areas to secure generative AI. And, you know, we talk about this data protection and I I think there's just this real concern about, for example, going to a a generative prompt, a chat GPT prompt, and trying to ask questions in the right way and getting a lot of secret information, top secret information, personally identifiable information, things like that. And certainly we're early, certainly there's, we're at the beginning of the research, the, the security research, the threat analysis, all, all of that. But it seems that it doesn't, doesn't work that way. It's not going to spit those things out. It's kind of antithetical to how that training works and, and how it delivers that information through that, the transformation and the generation. Certainly there's a lot of areas around that that core sort of methodology of the model that I shared on the previous slide. Like, for example, just the raw text that might be inputted, you know, where's that stored? Or how are, is the, the human training of the model where people make decisions to say, do this, don't do that? What particular improvements or potential errors are they introducing? Which I think that's very valid. So there's definitely risks 
We need to understand it better. We need to do the research. But my initial sense is we might be looking in the wrong place. And that's concerning because we're creating a lot of policies, a lot of laws, a lot of things like that. And it's just not clear to me that that's that's the right approach and we're looking in the right areas. So if I go and think a little bit more about you know, how we're going to go come up with ways to like really understand it from a business perspective and a risk management perspective. This for me is when I, when I first saw it to me, I, the light bulb came on for me that said, really, we can leverage a lot of how we saw the emergence of cloud, how we thought about that and how we've developed strategies and frameworks for being able to secure it. And I think we'll find a lot of it's applicable. Not everything. There's going to be definitely lots of new learning we're going to need to do to apply. But um, I thought it would be kind of fun to take something out of the archive. And the the layered uh, diagram that you see on the left and the shared responsibility little diagram. This was created back when we started Cloud Security Alliance in 2009 for our first guidance, um, our domain one architecture. Uh, Chris Hoff, who uh, came up with this, uh, really looking at what NIST had developed in terms of some definitional stuff and kind of putting his own twist on it. But we we sort of visualize software as a service as this layer on top of platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. And I think if you consider the the LLMs in a cloud context, which is pretty useful since it's going to be delivered as a service, like I said, you know, predominantly, or it's going to be delivered in the same modes as cloud compute in almost every case. It's really helpful. So if you think of it in that way, then that sort of bottom layer, what we call the infrastructure as a service, that cloud infrastructure, the raw storage and compute aspect of cloud, is it not like very analogous to think of the LLMs in that context? So you know, large companies might have their own private LLMs that maybe are, are specific to one domain of knowledge. Maybe it's like one specific infectious disease that you're going to build an LLM around. And on the other hand, you're going to have these public LLMs and the open AI uh, LLM is a good example of that, that it's publicly available. And then how do you access these? There's this middle layer, that middleware, the APIs, the rapid application development environment layer. That's what you're going to be using to build all of your applications. And so, you know, a relatively small number of LLMs, uh, public, private, compared to the number of SaaS applications, just the same as with cloud. You're going to have a few uh, very large hyperscalers, very large infrastructure providers. You're going to have more ways of, of developing the APIs and developing the application development environment. But then all of these business applications, millions and millions and millions and millions, whether they are SaaS or it's an enterprise's own sort of private applications, that those are going to reside on top. And so you could have an application that maybe simultaneously is using a public LLM as well as a private LLM. And when you think about enterprises, just like they're multi-cloud today, they'll be multi-LLM and they'll be hybrid. They'll be using some combination of public and private LLM. So I think a lot of that sort of contextualizing it is actually very useful. Shared responsibility, I think that should be pretty obvious, is that shared responsibility is something that is going to be uh, very persistent throughout this. And then when you think about, okay, we've, we've got that, we've got uh, this layered services model, we've got shared responsibility, then let's de develop the control frameworks and the risk management strategies and that supply chain, software bill of materials, all those different things that we need to find out what's new, but we can use a lot of those principles. And just that that CCM cloud controls matrix. Just wanted to you know double click on that a little bit. This is something we created back in I think that was released in 2011 around that time frame. And it's it's pretty pervasive. Almost all large organizations are using it. But when you look at it, you could say, hey, at this high level, the 17 high level domains, you could see 
a lot of these are going to apply, maybe all of them are going to apply to that fully developed generative AI enabled application. Uh, but we're going to, it's going to be drilling down and saying what new controls, what new implementations for old control objectives really need to be tuned to generative AI, to LLMs. Definitely a lot on the data side. We've got to understand the data models better, and we need to understand that. However, I think that data loss prevention as a, or data, data loss protection, that all is going to be conceptually things that are going to endure. So, so let's think about that and let's let's think about what we need to build. So, you know what so what does all this mean for cloud? So I, I really think the competitive nature and how generative AI absolutely creates benefits. Automation is really sort of the big thing. And definitely there's a lot of other things, but I think automation creates it creates a lot of other sort of downstream capabilities. You could argue that almost all of them are based on that. From a competitive nature. SaaS applications today, new SAP app, SaaS applications being built, they are going to need to be, uh, um, they're going to need to be Gen AI enabled. They're going to need to be using LLMs. And by the same token, when I talked about all this huge compute infrastructure and then to make that uh, available, that connectivity, it's it's really is pointing back to the cloud infrastructure providers. They're going to be very dominant in providing the LLMs to the market. And you can see that from uh, the partnerships from the companies that have the expertise in actually building these LLMs. Some of them are those cloud providers or they're working very closely with the cloud providers. So the, the cloud providers, when we think to the future, they seem to have the economics behind them to expand this like very efficiently. And it's just, it's very interesting for us to think, and I don't know about it, but we should be thinking about that. What is a Moore's law for, for GPT uh, five, six, seven beyond GPT four, which was quite a enhancement over GPT three. And what about quantum? You know, we, we talk about it CSA, maybe that's only seven, eight years out. And how is that? Cause it's certainly going to intersect with this and and once that's used you know where where are we going to be at that point you know what does it mean for malicious actors and you know we we've done a paper and i think other people are talking about that the paper we released at rsa and where we're going next the security implications of chat gpt is is the malicious actors are always early adopters i first became aware of earlier versions of gpt at uh, defcon a few years ago when they were creating better phishing emails in a proof of concept. And so it's going to be artificial intelligence versus artificial intelligence for the win. That's just the way it's going to be. And so that leads to like cybersecurity just by the same way, because uh, cybersecurity became cloud security and cloud security in a lot of ways, it is SaaS, uh, but cloud security is really the foundation of cybersecurity right now it's going to be sort of this gen AI security is going to be the next generation where you're going to need to use it to be able to detect malicious uses of AI to keep up with all of the scale that the uh, malicious actors, as well as just the scale of, of compute uh, and, the, and the surface that you're going to need to protect. It's just going to be a necessity. And so we'll 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 see how that all plays out. But I'm I'm pretty confident at that high level that this is how it's it is going to follow on and should be pretty interesting. So CSA, we are in the process of rolling out our AI safety initiative. And really the the idea for us is the same way we looked at cloud in 2008, 2009, is let's not look at it so much from the hype. Let's understand the long-term implications of the hype that this is a huge shift in the compute paradigm, but let's move forward in a way that gives industry, gives governments, gives regulatory bodies, gives risk managers the tools to make the right decisions in the moment on here's our strategy, here's where we can use it, here's where we can manage our risks. Ultimately, here's how we can make this safe. So uh, we we have developed just a 
initial mission statement that we'll go take a look at this and see if it's the right one as we assemble the team. And you can see about that. It's it's very much focused on us continuing to provide freely available best practices. We're not really helping the community as well as we can if we try to put them behind a, a gate. So we're, we're going to do this. We are focusing on, on this generative AI, machine learning, large language model portion. You know, there's other portions of the generative AI which are very closely related that our imaging video and and those also we will probably move in quick succession and what we want to do is give confidence to accelerate the adoption because there's a lot of good things this can do and because again we have to really if the malicious actors are doing it if your competitors are doing it so how can you do it uh, appropriately and really we we recognize the very important role that governments have in regulating this we just want to them to sort of see this balance as they're getting up to speed and say, oh, here's here's what the industry can do to regulate itself. And so we'll do the things that we need to do. And so hopefully that's how we'll do it. So we we hope to just kind of follow somewhat of that template that we've had and have the research, education, certification, all those different tools, have this global model, have this chapters model, everything else to, to disseminate everything we're doing you know, pretty widely. So again, this is about it being delivered as a service. This is about us like being here in the now, understanding where this might go in the pretty distant future. But um, the the matrix side and you know, the things about do we need kill switches for the AI systems? I don't know when those sorts of things are things that we'll all need to go uh, address. But we definitely want to uh, see if in this early stage of of AI being something that is pervasive, how can we create the right level of guardrails? And because we see just this this idea that almost all software applications that are, are, are providing some sort of business service are just going to be using it to some degree, that that's going to require their own vetting, and it's going to be a big it's going to be a big challenge. And so we've got to use that sort of cloud thinking in terms of scale. So we're thinking about it certainly in terms of the um, idea of security frameworks, best practices, um, understanding how AI can directly be attacked, understanding how cybersecurity can be improved, and understanding like the malicious actor side. So, you know, just a little bit about our structure. Um, you'll see our last speaker, Caleb Saima. He's actually the chair. He's just got great credentials. I think most of you know him. He's going to be chairing our executive committee. And then we're just taking like our research working groups and our areas that have developed our control frameworks, certification, training. And we're going to have this executive committee kind of create that strategy and roadmap um, in combination with them. And so really, this is about you. It's about you, the community out there coming together with us, participating in all these different areas. You can fit in every single one of these boxes if you want um, to help us build what we need to build. There's lots lots out of this for us to think about in, in terms of you know, where we're going next. It's really important uh, to think about uh, what's actually different. And when we, when we started in cloud computing, we understood, hey, there's some principles here that we've been thinking about forever that are very applicable still. And things like zero trust, I think zero trust is going to be a very important strategy, uh, guiding principles that we're gonna apply in very specific ways to lock down different types of large language models. So you know, what, what, uh, um, what are some of those new things? Like, you know, you get a, a AI system that, takes a fake version of a singer creating a new version of a song in their style. You know, what level of copyright uh, um, violation is that versus some of them are just very clearly um, true that uh, existing intellectual property rights laws just apply and we don't need to make a lot of changes. But there's going to be definitely a lot of nuances. So what can we use that we have and where do we need to be pioneers, I think, is what we want to go figure out. And Definitely, I always have that question mark next to my head. It's pretty common. So that's all I wanted to present. 
I hope this has been useful to you. I hope it's made some sense and I hope you can join the journey. You might notice that there's a little tweaked URL, the www.cloudsecurityalliance.ai. We're using that as a landing page, which is going to evolve all pretty rapidly, much like uh, the large language models and generative AI to actually add a lot of what's going on. But that's just a place you can bookmark to see what's new and what's changing. So thank you very much.